All right, guys, welcome back to the show. I am super pumped for tonight's episode. I have a special guest I, I found through Instagram, which tends to be how I find the majority of my guests these days. Uh, but but this one is is special. This is another dad that I'm bringing on to the show. Um, somebody that you know is is building a movement of his own. He he does uh, training and and. Really, his movement is all about equipping fathers to live an active, involved, healthy life with their children, and I just think that's amazing. So uh, without further ado, Michael, what's going on, my man? How are you? Justin, thanks for having me on, man, and you're absolutely right, doing a podcast myself. It's amazing how many guests we sign via uh, through IG, right? <laughs> Dude, it's, it's crazy, man. I mean, it, it just goes to show it's like a lot of people out there, and I talk about this all the time, but a lot of people out there, you know, they talk bad about social media and I, and I totally get it like there's definitely negatives that come from it but the ability to build a, a podcast I mean I've literally done almost a hundred episodes over the last three months and 75% of those have, have been literally me just DMing people on Instagram totally totally it, it social media can be a bad thing if that's how you choose to use it and if you choose to use it for good man it's it's a powerful tool so I, I'm right there with you man Absolutely. It's almost like anything in life, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, all, it's all perspective and how you look at it. Um, but, but Michael, so, so keeping it true to the, the podcast, I'm, I'm really excited to be able to, to dive into your story. And, and I don't know, you know how much of your story you've, you've shared with your guest. I'm sure you have. But um, yeah, man, let's, let's take you back. Where were you, where were you born? And um, kind of tell us a little bit about yourself as uh, kind of through those growing up in elementary school years. Yeah, man. So uh, I was born in Manhattan, Kansas, the little apple, not the big apple. And uh, <laughs> so um, in, uh, you know, going, let's see, elementary school, man. It's so funny because I'm actually in the process of writing a book right now. And I just not too long ago finished the chapter where I talked about how I came to find my purpose in life. And I started way back as a young kid and with that, with telling that story. And man, it's, um, it's crazy because I grew up with a fantastic family, uh, just wonderful mother and father, two sisters, one older, one younger. And, you know, I, I never wanted for anything. Uh, we certainly weren't wealthy by any means, but we were, we were upper middle class and I never wanted for anything, but I was always very, very driven for, uh, towards, I should say, um, adoration, um, acknowledgement, attention. And so, you know, a lot of people can take that a, a lot of different ways. Some people take that and, and run with that, that desire to fill that need in their life and, and do bad things with it. I actually said, okay, I'm going to get noticed for the good stuff that I, that I want to do. So I, you know, was in elementary school all through high school, like I never got less than an A. I was a straight A student every single, all 12 years of school because uh, they actually handed out, you know, letter grades back in first grade back then. <laughs> but, um, you know, so I, I wanted to be a good student. I wanted to be my, the, the student that my teachers adored. Like I, I wanted to be this, the teacher's pet. Like I, I wanted, you know, the, the acknowledgement that came from, you know, eventually in high school being, a, being the valedictorian. But man, what that, what that also does is you start to create an identity in yourself um, that is reliant on what other people think of you. And so while it never got me into any trouble, certainly in elementary school, I also got really good as people started, you know, giving me the, the attention that I was, I was seeking. I got really good at doing things to make sure not because I wanted to do them myself, but because of the, the adoration or the attention that it would get me. And I got really good at gaming the system. And so, I mean, you asked about elementary school, but I feel the seeds were planted there. Eventually in high school, I got really good at getting by without really doing much of anything simply because my teachers thought that I was a good kid. Um, and, and we can get certainly deeper into how that manifested itself down the road. But, you know, I, I, do continue to go back to I had a, I have incredibly supportive parents and a, and a great family. Uh, my my growing up years were about as enjoyable as a kid could possibly imagine. So um, 
yeah, that's, that's kind of where things start. Yeah, no, it's amazing. It's, it's always interesting. I mean, as I take people back and, and just kind of hear their story and learn about their journey, I mean, it's just like nutrition or, or fitness or anything else. You know, it's like every single person is so different. Like everybody yeah. has their own story. And, and there's so many people that like, don't really feel like, I guess they, they have a story to tell, or it's maybe not as exciting or crazy, you know, as other people, but it's just like, that's kind of the point of this podcast. It's like, you know, I love, I, I think that every single person has a story to tell. And so, um, yeah, man, it's, it's cool that you had that support with, with parents, because I know that, you know, that's, that's huge. And it's cool that you're able to like, you know, acknowledge that and, and then really pay it forward, you know, later in life and, and help other fathers, you know, kind of do the same and, and live out that same life. So that's awesome. Did you have brothers and sisters as well? Uh, growing up or was it just you or I had two sisters uh, so I had an older sister and a younger sister got it got or it have they're they're both here <laughs> yeah I <right>. have <laughs> got it and did you did you do like the whole like sport thing in, in elementary school middle school like were you playing a whole bunch of sports and then you kind of narrowed it down into high school or what did that look like in as a as an elementary school kid you know my main sport was uh, i played baseball um, i played baseball every summer uh, some summers i hated it some summers i loved it i think that kind of had to do with the the team that i was on at the time but uh you know I, it was mainly baseball i i spent a lot of time outside as a kid because our house backed up to a our city park and so I was at that park constantly, either on the baseball diamond or, you know, in, wading in the creek, catching tadpoles and, and minnows back in the creek with my friends or, uh, you know, just messing around on the playground equipment, getting out, going out at night and kind of scaring ourselves <laughs> in the dark shadows of the, of the park. But uh, yeah, it was baseball growing up. Eventually, once I got into middle school where we had more options, you know, I, I, was, I was not a big kid. And so I was never really all that interested in trying to put on some football pads and step out onto a football field and get clobbered by, you know, the guys who were twice as big as me. So I really gravitated towards running. <laughs> it was a non-contact sport. <laughs> and so uh, I got it once I got into middle school, I really, I really took to running and that became a lot of my identity in middle school and, and uh, on into high school and college was was as a runner a long distance runner very nice so did you do like the the whole like cross country thing or was it like more of the mile or I did no I did cross country and and then ran the longer distances the mile two mile the lowest distance I ran in track was the 800 uh, but I I hated track uh, once I got into high school just because it was pretty boring I mean eight laps around a track there's only so much you can do to distract yourself there <laughs> yeah but uh, I, man, I absolutely loved cross country. Um, it, it still to this day is the thing that I'll say. It's the one thing that I miss about high school. I just, uh, I absolutely loved cross country. I loved the camaraderie of the team that we had. And we were a pretty darn good team. We were one of the top ranked teams in the state of Kansas. And uh, all four years that I ran. And it was just, it was fun. And I was good at it. I, I had a kind of a natural penchant for distance running. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I actually did cross country as well. Um, and it, it all stemmed in elementary school. I actually had this amazing PE teacher named Mr. Cox, and he created the Owen Sprinters. And every Tuesday and Thursday, we we ran, it was like 30 minutes or whatever before school. But um, yeah, that led into cross country and, and really having a love for running. These days, I absolutely despise it, but <laughs> I don't do it at all either. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a whole nother story. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, so what position did you play in baseball? I kind of went back and forth between second base and shortstop. So I was a middle infielder uh, through and through. And, you know, it's, I don't like to say I have regrets, man, but it is a regret. Like I wish I would have kept at it just like I wish I would have kept at playing piano when I was younger. Um, it just, it's one of those things you look back and you're like, man, I had a talent for that. And I just did not, I didn't have the level of commitment that I think I have now and that I've established in my life. I mean, I can remember one time after a baseball game, we lost pretty bad and I was driving home with my dad. I was in the, the passenger seat of our car. And 
you know, he, he looked over at me and he's like, Michael, do you even, do you like winning? Like, what do you do? You, or do you, do you care about that? You guys just lost. I vividly remember that conversation. And I kind of nonchalantly was like, eh, I don't care. I, I kind of like winning and I don't really mind too bad too much when we lost. I just think it's a game. And my dad, he lit into me. He's like, if you're going to do this, if you're going to actually, you know, if we're going to spend money to put you in baseball and if you're going to go to practices and if you're going to play the game, like you have a commitment to your team, your teammates to care about what you're doing. And man, that, that did stick with me, but eventually I, I just kind of wore out from baseball. And it's one of those things where, man, I was, I was a pretty good middle infielder. I wish I would have stuck with it a little bit. Wow. Yeah, man, that, that resonates with me so much. I, Baseball was what I first started playing, you know, three, four years old or however you are playing T-ball. And I played all the way until I was a sophomore in high school. And yeah, uh, me as well, I, I got burnt out. I was playing uh, the last few years. I was playing like 160 games in a year between like high school and select. And so, yeah, I uh, definitely, definitely can understand that. <laughs> I, I love that conversation, though, that your dad had with you. I mean, I, and, and just knowing that you you know, you still remember it to this day. Like that's, that's, that's powerful because it goes back to the, you know, kind of, I guess what you're saying there in, in school, you know, it's like so many of the times we find ourselves maybe being good at things without actually having to work hard at them. Yeah. And if we get commended for being good without working hard, sometimes the, the working hard lesson, you know, isn't carried with us through life. You're absolutely right, man. And I, I want to be clear, like my, my dad in no way was, um, he never forced me to play baseball. It was never this thing where every year he asked me, do you want to play baseball this year? And, and for many years, even though I was kind of so-so about it, I said yes, because I had friends on the teams and, you know, eventually I, I enjoyed some of the games. But man, to me, I mean, I just, I remember it so vividly and it just underscores the influence that a father can have over his children. I mean, you're right. The fact that I even still remember that conversation and, and the point that he was trying to make there, like if you've made a commitment to yourself, if you've made a commitment to others and your teammates and some other people are depending on you, it's up to you to follow through on that and give it your all, whether you like it or not, like that's important. And, and a father's influence there and, and kind of calling your kids out on their crap sometimes is, is super important, man. And it flows into a lot of what I do today with Fit Dad Fitness. Yeah, I love that. Well, and I, I love that he asks you, you know, each season, right? Because yeah. Yeah, the more my wife and I think about it, I mean, I think what we're going to do is it's going to be, you know, like, of course, we're not going to force you to do anything. But like, if you sign up for the season, like you're going to finish the season out and you're going you're gonna to give it everything. And then if you don't want to do it the next season, that's perfectly fine, you know? Um, but I, I literally ran into this conversation with my son two weeks ago. We just finished his uh, soccer season for the spring. And the last week of practice, he was, you know, fussing around the house. Ah, oh, dad, I don't want to go. It's the last week. Can I just go to the game on Saturday and be done? And I, I had the same conversation with him, man. I said, you have made a commitment to your team and your teammates. You're going to see this through. You told us this is what you want to do, and we can reevaluate after the season, buddy. But you're going to practice, and you will put in the effort. Like that is a non-negotiable. Love that. Love that. So, talk to me a little bit about you in in high school. I mean, were you always like your you know your fit dad, fitness now? Like, were you always the the fit guy? Were you always in the gym? Were you always into health and fitness and all this through through high school years or? <laughs> No, man. Um, no, I didn't find the, the gym until long after. Uh, I, I tried. My dad and both of my uncles, his two brothers, they were all bodybuilders. And uh, they, my dad certainly, it wasn't for a lack of trying to get me into the gym. I even had a weight set in my room for many years in high school. And, you know, I'd, I'd do it for a time or two, <laughs> a couple days a week and, and stop and eventually stop. And, you know, I, I was a runner. And so, yeah, you know, I saw the weight room as as probably detrimental to my running, because uh, I was I was I was in it, and not to toot my own horn here, I guess, but I was one of the top ranked cross country runners in the state. 
um, certainly as a sophomore and a, as a junior. I tailed off a little bit as a senior, and that was frustrating. But uh, yeah, my sophomore and junior years, I was one of the top ranked runners in the state. And so I was, I was all in there and I saw the weight room as, as, you know, not exactly furthering my running career. So, um, but yeah, I, I, my identity was wrapped up in being a runner and a good student. And, um, you know, I, I, I towed the line for, for many, many years. I will say I, that drop off my senior year happened because I got, I, I made new friends and, and got kind of mixed up in, uh, the world of, of alcohol <laughs> way more than I should have. And that just became more of a priority to me. Partying became more of a priority to me. And I, I did my cross country season. My, I went through my senior year of cross country in the fall, but once track season came around in the spring, I didn't even go out for the team that year. And man, my, uh, my, my track coach in particular, my distance coach who had, who was our cross country coach as well, I mean, I can still see the look of disappointment on their face today when I told them that I wasn't going out for track. And it was, it was purely selfish reasons. Like I, I did not want to, uh, I wanted to party. <laughs> so, uh, but I was, I was, again, still very good at putting on this, uh, putting out this perception of this vibe that I was kind of the straight laced button up kid. And so I was valedictorian of my, my high school class. I was the uh, class president all four years of high school. I was involved in National Honor Society and uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes and Science Olympiad and Academic Decathlon, and just all, all, all the things. If, I was, if it was there, I was involved in it. It was all super surface level um, because I got, again, really good at others perceiving me to be a certain way and me capitalizing on that. It's, uh, it's not something I'm proud of, but it definitely, uh, definitely affected me. Wow. That's interesting. You know, it, it reminds me of when I was in high school, similar thing happened as well. It was for some reason it was cool in high school. And these were like in freshman and sophomore year to like smoke cigarettes and smoke um like black and milds and all that and here i am like playing all these sports and especially track that's probably where you notice it the most yeah. you know I, I i'm sitting here smoking these things every day and i start wondering why my times literally like i ran the 400 <laughs> uh like i mean they were, i felt like once like every week they were going up by a second i was like what is wrong with me what's going on you know i had no idea and uh <laughs> Yeah, I, that just made me think of that. But it's crazy, man. I mean, you, you know, it's the same thing. I, I when I competed in CrossFit, you know, like I stopped doing that like three years ago. But during that time of competing, I mean, I wish I had that discipline back when I was in high school for oh football, gosh. and I would have gone, uh, you know, somewhere way better than, you know, you're from Kansas. I went to Benedictine College in Kansas. That's where okay. I got scholarship to go play at. I know it well. Yeah. One semester and I was out. I was out. I came from DFW and I, I was the kid that was like, I, I hate my city. Like I want to get out of here. Like, <laughs> and I, and I go up there and I'm like, Oh, I love Dallas. What was I thinking? And I, yeah, it, was, it was hilarious. <laughs> Man, that's so true though. Right. I mean, you just, you think about the, the lessons you've learned out of the failures, right. Or the setbacks and, man, you're just like, I wish I could have applied myself in the ways that I know how to apply myself now. But without going through those times, man, I mean, it's, it's those times that teach you down the road, right? Absolutely. Well, and it's, you know, it's easy to talk about it now later, right? But sure. it's like when you're in it and like when I was in high school, I mean, the, only, the thing I cared about the most was what everybody else thought about me. The thing right. I cared about the most was like being popular. And yeah, that became detriment, right? Because you start doing things that you maybe wouldn't be doing if all of those other people were removed from the environment. Yeah. It becomes, it becomes more about keeping up a perception of yourself rather than actually displaying your true authentic self. Yeah. It's, it's, the, high school it's, exhausting. Version of, <laughs> it's, it's the high school version of keeping up with the Joneses, right? <laughs> exactly. Or, uh, you know, putting all of your highlights on social media or Instagram. It's, uh, oh, yeah. it, it never stops. It just morphs. Oh yeah, that's 100%. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So what was the transition? Uh, I mean, obviously you sound like an extremely smart kid and like you're involved in all of these things. Like, I mean, I would think that you went to college at Harvard. What, what, was, the, <laughs> what was the transition from high school into college and like choosing a school and your major and kind of that whole story? I knew from birth that I was going to go to Kansas State. Uh, <laughs> my family, as, as uh, I grew up a, a huge Wildcats fan, uh, went to football games, went to basketball games. My dad was an alum. My uncles were alums. My grandfather was an alum. My sister went. Uh, just it, purple, purple ran in our family, man. So I was dead set on going to Kansas State. And so I did. And funny enough, I, I got a full ride scholarship to Kansas State to study civil engineering. And Kansas State actually has one of the top engineering programs in the country. Yeah. And one of my uh, one of my clients actually went to Kansas State as well, and she's an engineer. So awesome. that's awesome. Yep. It's it's uh, it is a wonderful program, and I found out very quickly it is not for me, <laughs> <laughs> um, for many reasons. But yeah, like I said, I I did get in on a full ride. Um, you know, when I look back on it now, and we're talking a lot about looking back, you know. I got a lot of, uh, I won't say bad advice, but just ill-informed advice from my counselors in high school about where, what my major should be in college. Because I was getting good grades in everything, right? Uh, but because I wanted to go to Kansas State and it had the reputation of being an engineering school, I had many, many you know, counselors or teachers tell me, well, you're getting good grades in math and science. You should really go to Kansas State for engineering. And I, you know, you hear something enough and you kind of start to believe it. And so I said, oh yeah, that's, I think that's for me. I'm going to do this. So I went in there, man. And I just, I'm not an engineer. Like God bless the people who are, we need them. Uh, that is not my life. That is not what, what excites me, uh, special civil engineering, civil engineering. If you don't know, it's building like roads and bridges and, and uh, infrastructure, sewers, and things like that. Um, so I, I, and I actually ended up doing a, an internship the summer after my freshman year while I was still in that major. I did an internship with the Kansas Department of Transportation. And that was kind of what told me, okay, this is not for me. Spending a summer doing what I would be doing with my degree, it was, it was a, a painful time. At the same time, those bad habits that I had formed in terms of drinking and, and partying my senior year of high school just exponentially increased once I got into college. Um, I was a member of the marching band at Kansas State, so uh, that provided a, another environment, like a built-in environment of, you know, just parties and, and going, to, <laughs> going over to friends' houses and, and drinking uh, after games or whatnot. And so my grades suffered from that as well. And eventually I got myself to a point where I was on academic probation and I had lost all of my scholarships. And basically they told me, um, you know, you have one semester or you're kicked out. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. Going from getting a full ride scholarship to, and this, you said within the first year, the first semester this happened or? The, it was the um, first semester of my sophomore year that I had been placed on academic probation. Uh, so I had the second semester of my sophomore year to get my act together. And that was actually when I, I changed my major. Got it. Got it. Wow. That's 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 a lot <laughs> that's that's uh that's heavy as they say <laughs> you, you might you might now kind of see why i'm writing a book about it because there's a lot to it there's so much more to explain into how that happened man but yeah it, it, it goes back to what i talk to people about today when i coach them is i was not placing things that should have been a priority as priorities in my life i you know school and grades and going to class while it should have been a priority it simply wasn't i again cared about drinking and partying and what other people thought of me like those were my priorities and my actions and behaviors reflected that and my grades man they dropped off and they dropped off hard <laughs> oh yeah i i mean dude i trust me man i 
my story, I don't know if you've, if you've ever heard it, but yeah, it started in, in basically junior year of high school and led into much more than drinking. I mean, at our high school, like ecstasy was huge. And, you know, that led into then going into college and, and you know, it, identifying with those same types of people and, you know, eventually like getting it, losing my scholarship, getting kicked out of, of uh, school there after one semester. So mm. Uh, I totally get it, man. It's, it's easy yeah. to do, you know, it's very, very easy to do. And, and I think, um, you know, again, I, I look back on it now and it's, I guess it's easier to talk about, but when you're going through it, it's, it, I, I don't know, it's, it's just, it's hard, man. It's, it's something that you don't, you get caught up in that kind of like fast life or, or, you know, trying to, to impress everybody and be cool and all of this, you, you really do lose that identity. For sure. And if you don't have your head on straight and you get that much freedom and, and wiggle room to pretty much do whatever you want, you know, I was two and a half hours away from home. I had no one looking over my shoulder, no one telling me what to do. And college at that point was freedom from the expectations that had been put on me back home. You know, at home, I was the good kid. I did everything right. I, you know, valedictorian, straight A student, uh, go to church on Sundays. Like I was the poster child for what the good quote unquote good kid should be. And man, I rebelled in a hard, hard way. And it kind of sounds like you maybe did too. I mean, I, I will say I am, if there's anything that I am proud of that through that whole situation, I never did anything worse than drinking, but I say that in, in the same sentence, I can say, you know, I, I drove home drunk many times, put myself, other people's lives in danger um, it's just, uh, it's a, it's a bad thing to get into, man. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, wow. I have, uh, yeah, tons of stories I could share and, and I'm sure uh, regards <laughs> to that type of stuff, but Hey, you know, it's, it truly is one of those things where, I mean, if I wouldn't have gone through that, my, I, I there's no way I would be where I am today. And I, I learned so much from it and, and I learned very hard lessons at 18 years old, which I would much rather learn at that age than at 30 years old. Right? Without a doubt. Um, Without but, a doubt. But yeah, man, it's, it's, it's crazy. So, so how did you, all right, so, so this happens, right? And then how did, so you change degrees to what? So the actual changing of majors uh, kind of sparked my turnaround, man. Um, I, I went back and forth between two things. So I grew up, either always playing sports like we've already discussed or just I liked sports. I liked watching football, even though I really didn't play it. Um, you know, I was on intramural teams at Kansas state and loved it. And so I, I kind of bucketed myself into two worlds. I said, I can either, you know, be a, a trainer and, and go the kinesiology route. Uh, cause K state had a pretty good kinesiology program. Or I said, Hey, I, I like, talking to people. I like writing. I like my writing classes. Why don't I go into communications and be a sports writer? And ultimately being a sports writer won out. It's kind of funny now with what I do. <laughs> but uh, I, I said, no kinesiology. I'm going to go into mass communications and journalism. And so I started on a, a track to become a sports writer. Wow. Man, and I, it's so fun. like just knowing what you do now. Like I'm, I'm still feeling so confused. So I'm, <laughs> this, this is this is great. Uh, okay, so you tra transition into into the sports writer thing. Were you were you? Um, I mean, you were good at any, uh, everything in high school, but like writing in particular, were you? Did you find you had a knack for that in high yeah. school as well? Or yeah, and if I if I look back at high school, that was where I most enjoyed. Those were the classes I most enjoyed. The literary, the literary classes, the, the writing classes, expository writing classes, the English classes, where I could you know, be creative with my words and be communicative and tell a story with my words. Um, those were the classes that I, I just, I really enjoyed those, man. And so once I got, once I got on a path in college that I said, hey, I can make a career out of this. Like I said, that's what started to turn things around, man. I, I really poured myself into this new 
career and degree path that I had chosen, I saw it as a way to start new. I saw it, saw it as a way to recover a lot that I had lost and, and also learn a lot about myself and my ability to bounce back from, you know, kind of the brink in terms of my academic career. Um, I, I saw it as, Hey, I'm, I'm going all in with this for the, for the first time I, I really had to try very, very hard because I couldn't rely just on a preconceived notion of who I was to get by. Interesting. It makes me think back to what I mentioned earlier about the whole like working hard thing, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. sometimes just being good isn't, isn't enough. Yeah. Uh, that's powerful. It's, so did you, did you graduate with that degree then? And then what was like the first job kind of out of school? I did. I graduated with a degree in mass communications and journalism. I, uh, I eventually worked my way up to being the managing editor of the student newspaper there. And uh, the thing I'm most proud of is I actually, when I got put on academic probation, I had a 1.9 GPA and I graduated with a 3.2. So, um, I made a, I like when I said I worked hard, like I worked, <laughs> um, That's awesome. at the same time that I was the managing editor at the student newspaper, I actually was a freelance writer for the state's largest newspaper, the Topeka Capital Journal covering Kansas state sports uh, and, and serving as kind of a backup writer for them. And I also worked for a sports magazine called Powercat Illustrated and it covered Kansas state sports as well. So I was definitely on this path to sports writing. And so right out of college, I got a job as the uh, sports editor at a daily newspaper in Kansas. It was in Emporia, Kansas, home of Emporia State University, the Hornets. And uh, I was the sports editor. I had a sports writer who worked with me. And yeah, right out of, right out of college, I was a uh, on one of the, you know, the, the Emporia Gazette is actually in the journalism world, a pretty prestigious newspaper. If you've ever heard of the name, uh, William Allen White, he was an author, a politician and a newspaper man. Well, it was his newspaper. So, um, it was a pretty, it was a pretty big role for somebody fresh out of college to step into. That's awesome. Well, and I mean, that had to be a good, like confidence boost for you kind of coming off of, you know, the, the previous, uh, uh, adversity you had to overcome there, right? Yeah, it, it was, and it was validating in a lot of ways for sure. Um, I, I will say, you know, that whole process wasn't all perfect, you know, in, in order to work as hard as I did to turn around my academic career and, and get myself back on track, the things that, you know, it's just like everything in life. I had to prioritize and move things around. And so, you know, partying and a lot of friendships fell by the wayside. And I, I graduated with not nearly as many friends as I went into college with, um, just simply because that lifestyle was not my own anymore. And my, my path and where I wanted to be, I simply said, look, I'm not going to care about what other people think of me right now. I've got to right a lot of the wrongs that I built up in my life. And the first thing that I need to do is, is get my academics and my career in order. So uh, it was validating, but at the same time, it was a little bit sad too, because a lot of what I had, uh, you know, gone into college with, I had, I had certainly left behind. Yeah. Well, as, as you're, as you're talking through that, I'm, I'm like having this thought come into my head and I'm, this is when I'm, I'm back in high school and I, I, I don't even remember how old I was. I think I was like 16 years old. And I think it was like my, my mom, I was complaining to her. It was in the summer and I was complaining about how I had to work and none of the other, like none of my other friends had to work and they were all like enjoying <laughs> summer. Yeah. And she was like, you know, my parents made me buy my, my own car at 16 and like, we're very much so like, if you want it, you go and get it yourself, which I really appreciate to this day, you know? Sure. Um, but I remember complaining about that and I'll never forget. She looked at me and my mom is like so nice. She's like, never mean. <laughs> so, so this was kind of weird, but she looked at me and she goes, she's, she's like, Justin, you're 16 years old. Like in the summers, like you work, like you should have worked with, like, 
you should have started working before this. Like you have to buy your own car and like you have to pay for your gas and insurance. And like, like you're growing up, like you're not a little kid anymore. And I would just like, remember looking at her and I was like, fuck. <laughs> I was like, no, I was like, you know, but anyways, I, yeah, I, I guess I just, that's such a tangent, but I guess I, that thought came into my head as you were kind of talking through that story. Yeah. And you know, when, every time I tell this too, I, I have to also give a little bit further backstory in, in what also played a significant role in kind of changing things around for me, man. Um, so forgive me if I, I go on a little bit of a tangent here, but, um, I, to graduate, I had to, I only grad, I, it, it only took me one extra semester to graduate. I had to stay over during the summer semester to take one final class. Um, so I, I technically quote unquote graduated in the spring of 2006, but I had to take one class in the summer of 2006 to finish my degree. Uh, it, that summer I stayed of course back to take that class and I was in my apartment. I, I was working that summer as well. I, I was on the grounds crew. Uh, on campus. I don't know how I came to that job, but um, I came home from work that one day and I went in to use the restroom and I felt a lump. And because I had, I had just read a story about how you should check yourself and, and all these things, how important it was for even young men to check themselves, I believe was the, the topic of the story that I had read. And so I checked and I felt a lump. And dude, I, I freaked out. <laughs> I, um, I called my dad. I just, as soon as he answered, I started, I burst into tears like, dad, I think I have cancer. And I felt a lump. I did a check and I went online and it said it could be this. And I think I have cancer. And you know, my dad was just, um, he said, son, calm down. Give me a few minutes. I will call you right back. I hung up the phone and of course I go back online and start, you know, web MDing my, my, my condition again. And of course it's all saying the worst. My dad calls me back and he says, okay, you've got a doctor's appointment on Monday and this was a Friday. And I said, and he said, come home. And I said, well, I've got to work this weekend, so I can't come home. And he said, do you want me to come out there to you? And I said, no, I'll, I'll handle it. You know, I'll, I'll see you on Monday. Man, after that, um, after that phone call with my dad ended, I spent the next several hours just on my knees in my room crying. Um, I, I cracked open my Bible for the first time in years and just started praying and and pleading with god like i let me get through this and i promise you i will change i will and it, it's always one of those situations man where people get in that situation and they make promises to god and you know just save me and i will i will do this thing i will be a better person but that's exactly what i did i said let me get through this and i will make sure that i i live my life the way that you want me to live it and that entire weekend, man, was just that constant prayer over and over again. And I went to church for the first time in years. I sat in the back of the church and cried the entire time and prayed. I can't tell you a word of the message that the pastor said in that, in that sermon. Um, it just, it, it, it wrecked me. That weekend wrecked me. And, and the main thing that I, I told God was, I have been so selfish. I have been so about me and making sure that what I'm doing looks good to other people that I, I will change and I will make my life about serving others. I will make no matter what I do, no matter what career I'm in, no matter what job I'm in, no matter what relationship I am in, it will be about what can I do to be of service to others in the most significant and meaningful way possible. That was the bargain that I made with God. And so that Monday morning doctor's appointment rolled around, man. And thankfully, uh, after a very awkward ultrasound with a woman technician, <laughs> um, it turned out to be a benign cyst. And it went away on its own. They said, there's nothing to worry about. This is fairly common. But I, I was wholeheartedly changed at that point, man. 
And again, it just, um, that promise that I made that weekend, just crying my eyes out to God is one of the, if not the most significant and pivotal moment in my life personally, because the bargain that I made with God is what I try to live my, my life out in every way to this day, whether it is as a manager at work, whether it is with my children, with my wife, with my coworkers, with my friends, with the people that I come in contact with on social media, my goal is to be of service to you in some way. And, um, yeah, man, it's, uh, it's, it kind of gets me a little bit choked up every time I talk about it. Cause it is, it is, a uh, uh, it was rough to go through that, but man, it changed me. Wow, dude. I literally have goosebumps right now. <laughs> I, uh, again, I don't know if you've heard my story, but it's actually very, very, very similar. I was a way worse kid than you were, but <laughs> very similar moment. I so I when I was in Kansas, we got in trouble. I ended up, I find myself in jail, mm. and I that night, like I was not religious at that time whatsoever. That night, so I was facing. Um, <laughs> it was pretty crazy, actually. It was so I was facing uh, two felonies, seven misdemeanors, and two years in jail. Man, and I was not religious at the time at all. Um, I went into my jail cell. The guy that I was sharing a cell with was in there for stabbing two people. Um, mm-hmm. and I reached for a Bible that night in the same way, cried, begged, pleaded, like literally all the same, pretty much all the same stuff that you just described. And I said, if you give me this second chance, like, because I thought my life was over at that point. I mean, two felonies. Sure. Are you kidding me? Like you're done. You're 18 years old. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? Like, I promise, like, I, I, I promise I will dedicate the rest of my life to helping other people. And that next morning, I got out of jail. And long story short, I ended up um, actually getting everything expunged. And I ha- had nothing on my record. And but it, you know, 10 years ago, that moment changed my life. And it led the rest of my life you know, serving other people, helping other people. And I had no idea what the avenue was at the time. Yeah. Um, so, wow, that it's crazy just how similar like that moment was. Cause I can, I feel like out, out of a lot of people out there, like I can really, really relate to that because your story really resonates with, with what I went through. No doubt, man. And I, I guess I feel like we should mention to the listeners, like this is the first time you and I have ever talked. So <laughs> first time, this is, yeah. this is crazy, man. Um, but I, man, I, I believe with everything in me that throughout our lives, God speaks to us um, and he nudges us and he, he shows us a direction or a path, but he doesn't force us. But there does come that point where he kind of puts his hands on our shoulders and shakes us and says, you need to listen to me. And I, I feel like both of us have just described that moment to us and, and how we respond to that moment, I think sets the tone for the rest of our lives. You can go one of two different paths. You can turn away from it and turn away from your path and your, your kind of calling on your life, or you can go, go towards it. And man, it, it sounds like you have. And I know for myself, I, I chose to go towards that path. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a two way street at that point. When you get that second chance, it's like, do you go back on the word that you just said? Or do you truly embrace it and realize that you just got handed a second chance at life? Yeah, it's so true. (laughs) I love that, man. Well, dude, I, uh, God, these podcasts, they go by so fast. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) I definitely want to respect your time here. But Tell us just in, in these last few minutes here, like tell us a little bit more about like Fit Dad Fitness and kind of like what you're currently doing present day, uh, the podcast, kind of everything you have going on. Sure, man. I'll, I'll try to be short on words. <laughs> um, I, I stayed in sports writing for several years up until the point where I, I met my wife and we started to, and we got married and started to talk about having a family the life of a sports writer is not really conducive to that. It is long hours, it's late at night, and I was dedicated to being home and serving my wife. And so I left the world of sports writing and got into project management at a tech company back in Manhattan, Kansas. And 
I worked my way up to that point through a, a variety of promotions and steps up to the director of marketing. And that's, so that's what I'm doing now, although not at that company. I've had the, the immense pleasure and benefit and fortune of leading marketing teams at several different software companies over the last decade since, uh, since I left the world of sports writing. And um, I, I've, it's been companies as, as few as five people, 10 people, uh, startup mode, up to companies with 250 people and $78 million in annual revenue, $100 million even at one point. Um, so I've led marketing teams big and small, and I love it. Like I, I love leading and managing and growing teams and, and helping people in their careers. The fitness stuff, uh, the the Fit Dad Fitness, the personal training stuff, that's my side hustle. It's just something that I enjoy doing. There's a huge long backstory to that as well. And if you want more on that, I guess just go to fitdadfitness.com and you can see and, and hear all the stuff there. But long story short, I eventually got to a place after my son was born where I wanted to make sure that I was doing everything that I could do to be there for my children and my family for as long as I possibly could affect. And that's really where I started working on myself, my fitness, uh, not because I, I necessarily wanted to change the way that I looked aesthetically. I certainly did, but I really wanted to live a life of health and wellness and eventually, once you get to that point in your life, you want to bring others along for the ride. <laughs> and that's where Fit Dad Fitness came into play. And so I'm, I'm a certified personal trainer. I work with one-on-one -on -one coaching clients. I have my Daily Fit Dad, which is a membership site on my, on my website. And yeah, man, it's, it's like you said in the intro, it's, it's about equipping fathers with the tools that they need to live an active, involved, healthy life with their kids. And uh, that is my it's my passion project right now and i absolutely love it i've got my podcast it's it's just all over the place so uh i'm a, I'm a busy man but i'm a blessed man yeah that's amazing man that's, that's awesome how do you um i mean i guess a, a question that probably a lot of listeners have right now is how, how do you find the time for <laughs> for all of this i mean you, you got a, you got a six pack here on Instagram. You got, you know, you're a dad, you're a, you're a, um, a husband. Uh, how many kids did you say you had again? I've got two, two kids. Um, and then obviously, a, you know, a very busy career there and, and staying active and all these different things. So I always think back to the example, of, you know, Ben Bergeron, I don't know if you, if you're familiar with him, but he mm -hmm. talks about, you know, basically juggling kind of the five balls of life, if you will. And four of those balls are rubber, right? That could be your job, your, you know, whatever, right? Yeah. But the last, the last ball there is glass and that's your family. And so you're sitting here and you're juggling these five balls throughout life. Well, if you drop one of the others, it'll balance, you'll be able to recover, right? But if, yeah. if you drop the glass one, your family, then, you know, it shatters and that's a lot harder to, uh, repair. So I guess that long-winded question there is how do you find the time to prioritize, you know, one yourself, but you know, your, your wife and your kids and your career and all these different things. Man, I got really good at, at auditing how I spend my time and making sure that I was not um, prioritizing things that should not be prioritized over the most important things in my life. And what I mean by that is, you know, I live my life by um, the hierarchy or the, the prioritization scale of at the top is my purpose. What am I made for? What was I created for? And how do I pour into that? How do I make sure that I am, I am living out my purpose for my life? Below that is people. How do I make sure that I am investing in the relationships that matter most to me with my wife, with my children, with my friends, with my coworkers, making sure that those are in alignment there and that I give myself first and foremost to them. Now, mixed up in that is um, making sure that I am taking care of myself so that I can take care and serve others. That's a huge part of this and, and flows into the next one, which is passions. I have my passions, but they're never going to come before and above the people in my life. But 
they're the things that I deeply care about and that I prioritize and that I make time for. When I wanted to start getting to the gym, I said, I'm not taking time away from my family. So the evenings are out. Um, obviously, I work during the middle of the day. So guess what? Hello, 430 in the morning when no one expects anything of me you're my gym time <laughs> and goodbye. Uh, you know, staying up until 11 o'clock at night, goodbye, watching a lot of TV, uh, being present and in the moment in every situation and, and maximizing it is how I make the time for it. The final uh, kind of P on that list is profession. Uh, my profession will never come above my passions, the people in my life and the purpose. And I find whenever somebody has those out of whack, that that hierarchical structure in someone's life does not follow purpose at the top, then people, then passions, then profession, your life is out of balance. It's out of whack. When you put your profession above your, your passions, when you put your passions above people, your life is out of balance. You don't feel right. Something is off. And for me, it's, you've got to have those in that alignment, in that priority, and you've got to be dedicated to maximizing your time in every single one of them. Mm. Man, that's beautiful. I love that. Is that something you created yourself or is that something you, you, you got some from somebody or? It is. Um, that actually is the basis of my book that I'm writing. It is, uh, it's called The Involved Man, A Call for Men to Step Up, step up and Fight for the Things That Matter Most. And it's an outline of how men can be an involved man in all four areas of their lives. Nice, man. I'm excited for that. When can you <laughs> share, do you know when it's, when it's coming out yet? Can you share that? Or? I am so darn close, man. So my goal is to finish the draft by the end of June. And then I'm probably just going to self-publish just to get it out there. Um, I'm sick of writing it at this point. I've been writing it for about the last two years. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, this summer, uh, I would love to be able to announce some sort of a, a date on my birthday, which is uh, in July. Nice, man. That's awesome. Dude, congratulations, man. That is uh, Thanks, that's amazing. I mean, it's been an amazing story thus far. And I mean, God, I wish I had a whole nother hour. We'll have to bring you back on at some point. We'll dive into some more uh, specific, ta uh, specific topics there, maybe specifically for the, for the dads. Uh, but man, yeah. I think that was a great way to, to finish things off. Michael, where can everybody find you? Um, Instagram, the, 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 the podcast, guys, is, is Fit Dad Fitness. Um, and, well, I guess your Instagram, it's Fit Dad Fitness as well. So that's easy. Yeah. Um, but, dude, um, thank you so much for taking the time, man. I, I, I love connecting with, with others, as I said. And, um, yeah, man, I, I just love what you're doing. I love, I love the mission that you're on. I love what you're all about. I love – you know, this being the first time that, that we talk and meet and, you know, you just being able to be transparent and vulnerable and yeah, man, you just sound like a really cool dude. So I appreciate that. Brother. Story, man. Thank you so much, man. Thanks for having me on. And yeah, I'm, I, as much as I can be, I try to be an open book because I think it can help people and man. Yeah. If anybody wants to contact me, go to fitdadfitness.com. That's the hub of everything. And, uh, happy to, happy to interact with, whoever wants, as long as, as long as you're not some bot on Instagram trying to sell me likes and uh, followers, <laughs> I'll, I'll message you. I'll, I'll respond back. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, Michael, thank you so much for taking the time, man. I, uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, man, I look forward to kind of growing a connection and, and chatting more. For sure, man. Thanks so much.